is absolutely wild as Fern Gagne's all-star wrestling goes coast to coast and continent to continent. The greatest wrestlers in the world. He may be an apprentice carpenter, but I guarantee you he is a seasoned ring veteran. I've been hit with bar stools, bar rags, bar maids. I'm talking to you! They're scared that Hulkamania is still running wild. Oh, yeah. I got a big fat wife and nine kids at home, and I gotta feed them. And take a look at Jesse the body in real life. Open your hand once if you would. You want to see it? <laughs> this is absolutely unbelievable. Totally, completely out of control. He's coming in over the top. Hey! Look out! I feel personally attacked by that open. I really do. Because Joe Laurinaitis is yelling me, saying, I'm talking to you. I'm like, I, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. Speaking yet. of guys that, huh? Yet, yeah. Speaking of guys that don't do anything? Is Thank that you, you, yes. That's where I was going, yeah. See, you guys know it. You guys know it. You know, uh, <laughs> it could have been worse. Could have been Barry Darso yelling at you. No, he just yell at Joe. Oh, I yeah, take yeah. that as a badge of honor. You know, I, I I'm the hard hitting journalist. I ask the tough questions. Oh yeah, you'll be hit hard, all right. Once <laughs> yeah. yeah, you'll be demolished <laughs> on some blacktop by a bully. <laughs> you'll be crusher, crushed. No pun intended. No pun intended. What a great week! We'll see you after the Fourth of July. <laughs> hey, you know, sometimes sometimes we get off to bad starts, and sometimes we get off to uh, really bad starts. And for That's both of you still watching, well, we got something for you. <laughs> yeah, just wait. We'll we'll run you guys off too. That's How y'all right. doing? Doing well. Doing well. Getting ready for the uh, for the holiday upcoming, and uh, gonna be good stuff. Yep, this is the last show that we're going to do uh, for a couple of weeks. Not the last show we're going to ever do, but you know, but we're gonna we're gonna take next week off uh, because it's going to be the you know because I think we've got the fourth coming up in just a couple of days here, guys. Um, and then next week I'm going to be out of town, going out with the family. But then the week after that is going to be the uh, the week leading up to uh, the Hall of Fame in in waterloo mick that you and i are going to be attending and and you know joe's made other plans with you know and rightfully so i mean you know joe's got something on the books that he's you know he does every summer and it just happened to coincide but yeah no no show next week you guys just to just to let you know and we'll be back in a couple of weeks consider that a gift everybody yeah that's our gift for you that's just, right uh, but no how week. are they going to be how are they going to get bored <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And what, what's what's poor Jeremy Chura gonna do? Save us. Uh, no, well, he'll he'll save his back talk for when we come back. Yeah, okay. Sure. Well, guys, got a, a little bit of a little bit of business to take care of. I'm sorry if I'm going going to uh, to bore you, but here's the deal. First of all, we're gonna tell you about T Public. Uh, it's a great place to get. You can get shirts. You can get long sleeve shirts. You can get short sleeve shirts. You can get shirts that, uh, well, any kind of shirt you want. You can get a tee at tee public. Fuck, I stopped that. Let me start this over. Three, two, one. <laughs> hey, uh, why don't you go ahead and go to tee public, and uh, you can go ahead and uh, and rep the brand. We got a lot of good stuff there. See, I, I love just like, I like to. Uh, you think Marty O'Neill ever said, "Hold on, stop"? <laughs> Three, two, one. Okay. <laughs> It reminds me, of, uh, reminds me of <laughs> reminds me of the uh, Mean Gene when the <laughs> when the uh, backdrop fell down uh, during one of the uh, pay per views. Oh, that was a, a SummerSlam Summer, yeah. with uh, Rude and yeah. God, what was it? Yeah. And Gene yep. said, "Fuck it." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here's the here's what I love though is that you go through again. It's all leaning into the bit, you guys, and I really appreciate you guys doing it. Um, so, uh, yeah, T Public, we got some cool stuff there if you want to rep the brand. Uh, as well, I'll try and get serious here. We've got the uh, the Pinfall membership, you guys, which we feel is a really good value. It's four ninety nine a month. You can get uh, our live streams later on in the month. Usually, I know we didn't have one in June because of scheduling. We're going to have two coming up in July, uh, so keep an eye out for that. They're usually seven o'clock central time on Sunday nights. 
So we've got that. You get our watch along um, that we, you know, we just did our, our last one just a couple of weeks ago. Um, we've also got the, you can get the podcast a day early. We've got exclusive interviews that we've done. James Beard was on there. It was absolutely awesome. Um, Herb Simmons was on there. And I think that's, you also get a letter from me with a magnet and a sticker. It's just a, just a little ditty, a little, little thank you. So there, there's me being a little more serious with the plugs. And well done, my friend, as usual. That's why you get that seven-figure salary. Hold on. Three, two, one. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> but the thing is, that seven-figure salary, the decimal point is at the far left. Picky, picky. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's uh, seven seven tenths of a of a second of a. Yeah. Of a we got a good Q and A today. Good questions. Uh, it, it's another one where you know I like these because these are ones that you guys like. Nick, you get random emails, and you know people are always asking questions. There's there's no shortage of information that people want to know. I mean, we've been doing this show for two and a half years, and you still get questions that we. I mean, there, there's no end to people's wanting to know about some of the subjects that we're going to talk about today. We got 30 years of AWA history to talk about, plus whatever's gone on in the lives of the uh, of the stars since then. So, yeah, keep them coming. We, uh, we love these Q&As. I agree. With that, let's roll. Let's, uh, let's get going. This is for Mick and Joe from Pat York. Uh, do you think Harley Race would have made a good AWA champion, and would Nick Bockwinkle have made a good NWA champion? Great question. And you're talking about two of the greatest that ever lived, you know, right off the get-go. Uh, would Harley have made a good AWA champion, I'm assuming singles champion? Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, Harley Race would could have been a champion any place in the world. Um Harley, of course, was a tag team champion in the AWA along with Larry Hennig. Um, as far as the singles run, and look at, there they are. Oh, my God, what a picture that is. That is a picture etched in time, folks. Uh, two of the all-time legends, Harley and Nick. Uh, Harley, you know, early on, you know, early 1970s, he was all, already being courted for the NWA. And uh, Harley certainly found a, a home there. Um, I, was, was Kansas, I know this is kind of off the beaten path here, Mick. Sorry about that. But yeah. was, was Kansas City a, a big NWA town? It was. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that makes sense. That makes sense then. Yep. Yep. Kansas City. And then, of course, Harley went in and uh, became a big time player in Kansas City. And the rest is history. You know, one of the greatest NWA champions of all time. Nick is another guy. Could have been a champion anywhere. I don't think he would have fit as a champion in WWF because he was too much of a wrestler. Um, Nick, of course, was offered an opportunity, a run with the NWA championship, and declined uh, because he had half the schedule and just as much money working in the AWA. Uh, so either way, you plug these guys into any championship and they belonged. I really don't have anything more to say to that other than you're correct, Mick. Two of the all-time greatest, and they would have done spectacularly wherever they went. For uh, for Harley, though, in the in the uh, 70s at least, it would have been very difficult when you've got Nick here yeah. as the champ yeah. already. And then, of course, Vern sitting in the wings waiting for a championship uh, rematch or, or match. So to have Harley and Nick on the roster at the same time, um, that would have been interesting, yeah. Yeah. but you know, if Nick would have, if they would have just flipped, Oh yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, those two champions in any league, and I would even say the WWF, maybe Nick would have transformed their championship to a wrestling championship. I didn't know that Nick had been earmarked for a run or they had proposed an NWA run for him. I had, I had no idea. Yeah. And, and Nick was living in Minneapolis, St. Paul. So he's in the uh, home of the AWA. Mm -hmm. And as I said, he's wrestling half the dates had much more time off and the money was just as good. 
So, you know, that that's kind of a no brainer there. And lucky for us, you know, yeah. in the law. Well, and, and Nick was living here already. Yeah, so, yeah. you yeah. know, to, to leave his wife even more or to have to move would have just, quite frankly, been a real pain in the ass. There you go. Yeah. And at that point, I mean, the AWA just as much prestige, right? As oh, no the NWA? Question. No, well, it okay. it uh, it deserved as much prestige. Oh, okay, maybe, yeah, maybe that's okay. Yeah, maybe yeah. that's how I should have phrased From it. From a publicity standpoint, you know, not quite as much as NWA, but certainly mm -hmm. every bit is worthy. Okay, all right. Uh, let's go to well. This one is for for me. Does you want me to read this to myself, or does no, somebody I'll want read to read it? it? I'll read oh. it to you, Chris. Okay, it's, that's oh, good preparation on my part. This is what <laughs> happens when I have a an extra inning Twins game the night before we do a podcast early. I can't get T public right, and then I don't really look at the questions ahead of time. So this is about as on the cuff, on the fly as we can get. I, I, I didn't notice any difference, to be honest. But <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> your question, Chris, is from Jason Overman. I loved the Eric Bischoff, Bischoff interview, and from what I could see, the viewership was through the roof. Just out of curiosity, was that the most watched podcast? Oh. Thanks for keeping the memories alive. Thanks for the, the question. And no, it was not the most viewed. Uh, you know, it, it did gangbuster numbers right away as we expected. And it's still doing, you know, pretty good numbers because what you guys see on, you know, on, on, the, the channel, if you look, it's like that's just a portion of the views of the analytics that come in for me. But that doesn't even crack our top 25, which, if you think about it, guys, pretty amazing. That considering is amazing. We're, considering we're just a, a small grassroots, no major benefactor, you know, we're all doing this, the three of us, right? I mean, we don't have, you know, any you know, big push behind this is, this is why we are, we focus on, on the listeners and the fans because the fans are the ones that are going to make this thing go. Um, but to answer the question, no, the, uh, the number one that we have wow. is one that we did early on with these two guys. That it's one a, is, is, and that is a great picture of uh bruiser and crusher. That was one of our early ones. I want to say within the first, I don't even know, first 10, maybe. I would say it, so, yeah. And and it's done. People, I, I think when I see something like this, it's either got to be an interview that really resonates with people that they've been kind of anticipating. Or what I've also noticed, guys, is there really is a there's a desire for the old school, whether you want to relive the memories or you're like me and you just want to learn because you didn't get a chance to experience it. So uh, um, Crusher and Bruiser are our number one. Uh, Vern and Wally are close behind. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's amazing how well those have done and we just want to continue to grow and you guys you guys help again completely grassroots but uh yeah crusher and bruiser i think that kind of tells you where you know where a lot of the interest is no question about it and an interesting thing about that picture too if i'm not mistaken that was a, a milwaukee shot maybe uh the reason being the ring announcer in the background if i'm not mistaken is gus hall and he is the father of Steve Hall, a.k.a. Tom Rocky Stone. And if Tom Stone is watching and I'm off by, uh, you know, a million miles and that's not your dad, I apologize. But uh, it certainly looks like it. And uh, no matter how you slice it, Crusher and Bruiser talk about legends in this business. Yep. People loved him 30 years ago. They love him today. How about that? There you go. All right, this one is for you, Mick, from uh, Rich Geising or Gelsling. Gelsing. Jesus Christ, this is an awful morning for me. <laughs> Jeez. In reference to Larry and Kurt, would you agree that they both belong in an AWA Hall of Fame? I'm never doing a show early in the morning after I have an extra inning Twins game the night before. Sure you are. 
No. Um, but yeah, uh, Larry and Kirk in an AWA Hall of Fame. Do I agree? No. Um, and I think Joe will agree with this from an obvious standpoint. Uh, Larry Hennig belongs in an AWA Hall of Fame based on his AWA career. Kurt Hennig really developed after he left the AWA. He was an AWA champion, um, but, you know, he was still a little wet behind the ears, even when he had the AWA title. Uh, Kurt had a Hall of Fame career in wrestling. AWA, he was just getting uh, just getting going. Uh, you could see the signs that there was something there, something magical. Turned out to be that way. But of the two, Larry Henning, no doubt about it, belongs on a Mount Rushmore of the AWA. I hate to say this, but I agree with you again, Mick. Um, Axe, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. I know. It, 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 what the hell is going on? We're, we're yeah. getting along. Um, but, yeah, I mean, Kurt... The Mr. Perfect persona, to me, the incarnation started started in 1986. He went from the pudgy kid with um, the Brillo pad head of hair to the longer flowing bleach blonde locks, uh, started getting himself more into shape, and really got into more of the Mr. Perfect personality than this, much like I'm doing now, the, the stammering baby face who didn't know how to cut a promo. Uh, but, and then he was gone in, uh, I believe it was 1988, maybe 1989. Yeah. So very short window uh, of him, but that's that's when Mr. Perfect began, and then it got perfected when he yeah. went to the WWF. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Kurt, well, I, I, uh, I, Kurt no, the axe, yep. I, I think that kind of plays into what a lot of fans, myself included, we look at somebody and they're like, man, they were so good, so good. But then you look at where they're at in certain parts of their career and say they were one of the best ever. But at that point in time, they were not there yet. It's kind of like a, a a player, you know, a baseball player going through the minor leagues. Oh, man, guy's a Hall of Famer. Well, when you're playing low A ball, you're not there yet. You don't have that skill right. set. You're double A. You don't have that skill set. You get to the major leagues. That's where it, that's where it kicks in. And we could see the beginnings of it in his promos towards the end of his AWA run as a heel. He started taking those shots at Greg Gagne, of course, and Vern. And, and you could see that personality developing in, you know, whether it was Vince or creative or Kurt himself, mm -hmm. uh, they, they fine tuned it and the rest is history. Well, and the funny thing about it is it was so easy for Kurt because that's who Kurt was. I'm not saying that he was perfect, obviously, but the, what you saw on camera really was a great example of what Kurt Henning was in real life. And uh, to say that he liked to rib people is <laughs> the biggest understatement that I've ever made in my life. Yes, sir. All right, let's get to the, uh, the next one here. Uh, this is for you, Joe, from Samantha Anthony. Uh, she said she was a fan of Eddie Sharkey's PWA shows back in the day. Impressed by the Terminators tag team, uh, they went to the AWA towards the end. Did you have a chance to work with them? I did. I did. Uh, unfortunately, if I'm remembering correctly, their first match uh, <clears throat> on All-Star Wrestling didn't go too well. Um, I think a part of it was and I'm going to probably get heat for this and be called a, a, a heel podcaster again. But they, they were maybe presented in the mold of the Road Warriors. And, and anybody at that time that was painting their faces like the Road Warriors at that time, the comparison was going to be made to Animal and Hawk. And as good as... Uh, they, they were in the indie scene. Um, it just didn't translate over to the AWA audience. 
But as we have mentioned before, I do have to add that not much was resonating with the AWA audience at that time. Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage could have come to the AWA in 1989. And I still question whether or not there could have been a revival. You know, it just, the, the, the product was soured on by that point. That is two great points, Joe, uh, not only about the status of the AWA at the end, but also, yeah, the comparison to the Road Warriors, you know, we had Mad Max and Super Max, the Max Brothers in the AWA about that time. And, of course, you know, all, all the other incarnations or attempted incarnations of the roadies didn't work. As far as the Terminators are concerned, they're both local. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Rignati and Doug Fisher, I want to get them on the show. They will have some hellacious stories, I'm sure, not only about the AWA, but about Eddie Sharkey. So uh, we'll try to get them on. You know, you brought up the Max Brothers, and I might be confusing that first match not going so well with the Max Brothers. Mm -hmm. um, so, hey, don't remember everything from back in the day. But I do remember that, you know, I, I did work with them. And, again, it, it, nothing really resonated when it came to the AWA at that time. I feel bad for some of these guys that, you know, they're like, oh, you know, we're going to present you as the road warriors. It's like you're not even giving them a chance to succeed once you're making that comparison, because then no matter what they do, they're never going to be able to, to get over on their own merit because they're always going to be compared to a team that the bar is just so incredibly high. Chris, it's like an Elvis impersonator. You know, a, a guy can be the greatest Elvis in person. He say, "Oh boy, that was great," but you know, Elvis, not Elvis. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what you got going. Yeah, there. yep. That's yeah, really a shame. It is really a shame. Uh, this is for you, Mick, from Randy Kitzman. Who'd oh. win between Hulk Hogan and Billy Robinson? I assume <laughs> we're talking about a a shoot fight. Randy Kitzman. <laughs> Gotta love Randy. Uh, you know, he comes up with some questions, as he did 30 years ago on SNR. Uh, you never know when Randy's going to come up with something. Uh, in a shoot fight, uh, come on. I mean, you know, let alone a wrestling match. Hulk was a big, strong guy. Um, who would win? Okay, if the over and under is on time, I'll go the under two minutes. And uh, I would say that Billy Robinson stretches Hulk probably in that time frame. Uh, you know, Hulk might do okay in a street fight, but, you know, once Billy got a hold of him, it would be all over. Yeah. Again, we agree, Mick. What the heck is this, Groundhog Day? Oh, my God. Deja vu, Groundhog Day. There's Billy Robinson. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we're not going to denigrate Hulk. He was a big, tough, strong kid. There's no question about it. No, you don't want to fuck around with Hulk Hogan. Mm -hmm. But I tell you what, if you're Billy Robinson and you do that double leg, night-night uh, Hulk. You know, that's Well, I mean, all that. Hogan would have to do is run to Billy Robinson's right, and Billy wouldn't know where he's at. Oh. Wow. <laughs> that, that, I, think, I think we have just – Hit the lowest curb ever, or at least since Joe's back board, uh, we hit we hit oh. some lows earlier on. But uh, boy, that was oh, just wait, we can go lower. <laughs> There's always lower, man. There's always to lower. the limbo. <laughs> Tell me when I'm telling lies. Tell me when I'm telling lies. Uh, this one is for uh, for me. Uh, I'll take you it, want Chris. Okay, yeah, anything that comes up for me, again, I did a great job of prepping because of my baseball game last night. Um, yep. Yeah, I'm going to let you, anytime there's a question for me, I'm going to let you read it to me, Joe. Okay, um, I'm going to have to pronounce his name uh, in uh, last name as they do in Polish. So this is from Andy Laskowitz. Is there any former AWA wrestler that you would flat out refuse to have on a podcast and asked if they could be on. Uh, it's an easy one for me, but the question's for you, Chris. Uh, there's only one, and I believe, I don't think he is uh, given a call or to do a video call from where he's at. Um, 
outside of that, no. I, there, there's nobody that is, you know, that is not welcome. There's nobody that uh, is not, if, you know, I know there are people that want to come on. All you need to do is, you know, get in contact with me. We'll set it up. We'll figure it out. But yeah, there, there's, I mean, there have been people that we've wanted to get on that we just haven't been able to, but we're still efforting. Um, but yeah, there, there's nobody that is, nobody that I would flat out say no to. Well, I know who you're talking about with the one guy, and it might be might be tough to get a, a video camera in there, maybe a, an old brownie or an Instamatic. Um, Pack of cigarettes, maybe? Something like that. Uh, as far as, um, there's some people out there that we were, were on the fence about. Uh, we'd like to get them on the show, but we, we just aren't sure, you know, how things are going to play out on the show itself. So we kind of talk about that amongst the three of us. But uh, good answer, Chris. Very diplomatic. And we are right there with you. But the thing is, guys, you know, you talk about camera being an issue. They've got security cameras all over the place. It's just that the angle would not be that great. You might not get off the audio. Um, you know, the lighting. I'd, ra I'd, ra I'd, ra yeah, I'd rather see John Cusack and say anything doing this with a boombox than, uh, than the other, other boombox. Okay. Yeah. Give me yes. some Peter Gabriel above my head. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Shock the monkey. <laughs> Oh, my oh, God. Boy. I was not expecting a Shock the Monkey reference. Wow. <laughs> well done, Mick. That could go many different ways. Um, <laughs> let's go for uh, for all of us from uh, Michael Levine. Uh, he's got a two-part announcer question. Roger Kent, Rod Trongard. Uh, part two, whatever happened to the Polish Eagle, Dick Chankowski? Shock I'm gonna the hit. Monkey. I'm going to alienate a lot of people, um, a lot of diehard AWA fans, um, because I'm going to go with Rod Trongard over Roger Kent. And this is nothing personal. Roger Kent was, was the face of the AWA for all those years. There's no question about it. Uh, there's Rod Trongard, of course, with our good buddy, Jumpin' Jim Brunzel. Um and it's not because I worked with Rod. I think of the two of them, if you listen to their commentary, Rod, because Rod talked more, maybe. Uh, Rod, I think, called the matches more than Roger Kent did. And Roger would have a tendency to just say, you know, the cliches. You know, he doesn't know if he's foot or horseback or, you know, he's... You know, Katie bar the door. Katie bar the door, whatever it may be. Yeah, Roger Kent, along with Marty O'Neill, you know, they were the faces of the AWA and certainly their recognition. But I, I would have to give Rod the nod in terms of play-by-play. Uh, -play. As far as Dick Jankowski is concerned, um, the Polish Eagle. And, you know, another one of your brethren there, uh, Mr. Chupik. Uh, Dick Jankowski has been through more physical shit than anybody should ever have to endure in the last several years. A couple of years back, we were lucky uh, enough to have Dick at the AWA reunion. He has battled back from so many, so many illnesses, auto accidents, you name it. Uh, the former voice of the uh, Minnesota Gophers, mm -hmm. uh, public address announcer, loved Dick Jankowski. The man that actually fell asleep uh, during an interview with me, which I can understand, uh, with a with a Bismarck uh, dripping out of his mouth at the Perkins and Shakopee, uh, that is uh, that alone makes Dick legendary. Although several people could claim mm -hmm. that distinction, dozing off when I'm talking, like right now. Uh, but uh, there you go. I'll, I'll hand it over to you, uh, Mr. Chupin. <laughs> Let me start with Dick Jankowski. Um, I, 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 nothing bad to say about the guy. I mean, the, in my opinion, the greatest MC of any event that you could have. Uh, Dick has wit and humor, and his timing and delivery are He's so sharp. 
Oh, it, it's incredible. Every time, I, I mean, I, I was an equipment manager at the University of Minnesota when Dick was there. That's where I first met him. And then when he first came into the AWA studios, we recognized each other and uh, and so forth. And then seeing him at the reunion, uh, I think uh, two years ago, he still is as sharp as a tack. Obviously, we've all aged, but He's he, hilarious. I mean, he's just flipping hilarious. Yeah. Um, in terms of Roger Kent versus Rod Trongard, uh, I, I I wrestle with this one, no pun intended. Um, from this perspective, it was it, it's like comparing who is a who is a better player, uh, uh, Barry Bonds or Babe Ruth. Now, I know the time, the, the eras were that much different, but my point is when Roger Kent was doing the AWA, it was still, it still had like an indie wrestling feel to it, you know, and, and it, it was done in a very small studio and, and um, uh, in syndication only. And a lot of the times on stations that the AWA paid for. Roger's lines were classic and legendary, and he did it by himself, whether Vern liked it or not, sometimes on the commentary. But Roger had his own style that I thought worked fantastically for the era. Would Roger have worked well in the 80s on ESPN? No. Uh, moving on to Rod... Yeah, Rod Rod called an incredible match, uh, but I've I've stated this before, from a production perspective, our our issues that we had with Rod, he wouldn't shut up. He he was delivering it as a radio announcer, and in radio, mm -hmm. a second of dead air or two seconds of dead air is. A, a death knell. It's like, no, you can't have dead air. But if you're on TV, you can take that breath because you still have the visual to complete the picture. So when Rod was doing TV, he was still providing a description as a radio announcer. And it's like, Rod, just, you know, ease off a little bit, back off. Let your color commentator talk. In fact, Lord James Blears, I believe, in one of the matches, in, for all intents and purposes, says, shut the fuck up and let me talk. You know, so who would I prefer? It's a flip of a coin for me because of the different eras. I enjoyed both of them. Worked with Rod extensively, a consummate professional. Um, I didn't get the... Uh, the fortune of meeting Roger Kent, but uh, as a kid growing up, I mean, his one liner is Katie bar the door. Um, I still use that line to this day. Yeah. I don't have a preference over either one of them. Sorry, Mick. I think I just no, stepped in on fine. you. Um, I don't have a preference because I don't remember either one of them. Um, my preference, honestly, is Mick Karch because Mick Karch is the one that I remember, and Ooh. Mick Karch is the one that I yeah I I know I know and it kind of makes me dirty to say it, um, but you know as uh, you know it's interesting when you talk about you know radio guy making the transition to TV, you can tell them because I've had to try and make that transition before. It is very very hard when you're trained in a certain way. And I can understand your perspective on it, Joe, where it's tough as a production guy. Um, as for Dick Jankowski, again, I don't remember him in the AWA, but my first experience as well was uh, when I was doing some University of Minnesota play-by-play. Uh, -play. That's why I met Dick Jankowski at uh, U of M. And he's every bit the personality and the goofball, and there's nobody better for what he does than the Polish Eagle, Dick Jankowski. Just a couple of final thoughts. Uh, Rod Trongard did Minneapolis Lakers basketball on the radio. So that goes to Joe's point uh, as far as the, the transition from radio to TV. And I will forever remember Dick Jankowski's line. 
at Nick Bockwinkle's 60th birthday party when he said Nick had a strobe light installed over his bed to give the illusion that his wife Darlene was moving. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> only uh only Dick Chudkowski. Uh he he is one of a kind and we're very fortunate to to know him. This is for you, Mick, from uh, Vincent Lafon. What was the connection between Playboy Buddy Rose and Colonel De Beers? Interesting. Uh, they, uh, as I mentioned before, they lived here in the same apartment complex uh, in Richfield, Minnesota, in uh, I believe 1986. Uh, Sherry Martell and Scott Hall were in the same apartment complex. Uh, the Colonel and Playboy Buddy Rose actually had teamed up. Uh, up in the Pacific Northwest, uh, particularly the Portland area. Colonel De Beers was not Colonel De Beers at the time. He was going by his uh, real name, Ed Wiskoski. And uh, Paul Pershman, Buddy Rose, as you can see there, had just started inching toward that uh, illustrious 217 pound mark uh, <laughs> when this picture was taken. Uh, I believe the two of them actually ran a training school together up in that part of the woods and uh you know so they knew each other for a long long time two great veterans of this sport two ring generals uh my history with paul is well documented colonel de beers one hell of a guy seeing buddy that slim at least you know compared to what ended up happening to him I got to believe after visiting your place, Mick, that uh, he ended up going and investing in a shit ton of chocolate milk and uh, blocks of cheese uh, after that. So uh, hopefully he did that and by his own purchasing power, raised the stock on both of them. Yes, I know that that was a bad joke, but. No, 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 it's, that's good. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm no Polish eagle, more like a, a, a Polish sparrow, I guess, but. <laughs> uh, Paul actually wrestled in some parts of the country as Hippo Calorie. Uh, I don't know if you were aware of that, but uh, he did. God Hippo bless him. Calorie. God, that's so there you go. Uh, this one is for uh, da, 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 this is for you guys. Um, I don't even know who it's from. Um, I'm gonna. I don't know. Spanky McGee here. Uh, I remember attending a big card at the Civic Center. Might have been Vern's retirement match when Mean Gene introduced several nationally known promoters to the audience. Don't remember any of them standing up to take a bow. Was they shy or was this kayfabe? I remember. I remember this really well. And I honestly I, don't know who the name is on this. It wasn't. Well, you know, it doesn't matter. It could be anybody that was there and, and knows what this was all about. Uh, it was a big show. I, I forget what it was. Civic Center was sold out as per usual. And uh, me, Gene, was doing the ring announcing. And he said, I want to welcome, you know, some dignitaries in the audience. And if I remember correctly, he mentioned Eddie Graham, promoter out of Tampa. Uh, I think he mentioned Bob Geigel was in from St. Louis. Uh, he mentioned that uh, Sam Muchnick uh, came in, might have mentioned a couple others. And as he was introducing, you know, you're looking around the arena, nobody was standing up. So my guess was that uh, this was total kayfabe. Uh, you know, he could have thrown in the president of the United States or, you know, the head of Chevrolet or whatever it was at the time. And I don't think anybody would have stood up. But uh, uh, typical Mean Gene Carney. But, uh, you know, it certainly enhanced enhanced the moment, uh, even though nobody took a bow. <laughs> Well, the, the thing is, with the names that you mentioned, uh, if, if this was indeed Vern's retirement match, uh, I believe that was 19, May of 1980? 81. It, it was a, May, May of 81, okay. Um, the internet wasn't around, and unless you were a diehard, and I mean diehard wrestling fan who – got the magazines those other names really didn't resonate with you for the casual fan and if you've got 19,000 people in the audience you know maybe 10% of them are you know die hard i'm talking 
you know, like like Mick uh, was back in the day, where you knew the other territories. But growing up, I I never heard of Sam Munchnick or Eddie Graham. Mm-hmm. Um, it 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 just didn't. I don't think it would it resonated with the casual fan that was in attendance that night. Well, you know, and I think that that's probably Gene pulling a rib. You know, you may be right, Joe, that, you know, he's appealing to 10% of the audience who knew who they were, and he's just throwing names out there. Mm-hmm. You know, he could have thrown in Senator, Senator Rudy Boschwitz or anybody else, but uh, you could clearly see that Gene was, uh, in his moment, he was having a good time. <laughs> I remember that very well. I wouldn't put it past Gene to do that, Rib, either. No. Would Gene, do you guys know, would Gene be one of those guys that could get away with that? Okay, because I, okay. Oh, God. Gene could get away with anything. I mean, by that time, Gene was so entrenched as not only an announcer, but a personality here. Everybody loved him. And yeah, Gene could do whatever he wanted. Yeah, Yeah. no doubt. He he could do no wrong. Although, I'm, you know, Vern, I'm sure on more than one occasion did the let's raise my forehead (laughs) even more and geez. Yeah. Okay. All right, I, I'm just going to keep because it sounds like, you know, sometimes Vern was very, you know, kind of a taskmaster with certain things, but, you know, something like that. No. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, that's the word on the street anyway. Yeah, uh, okay. This one is, uh, oh, sorry, Joe. The next go ahead, one Rick. is for Chris from yeah. Roman Sanchez. Nick, Roman. Nick, his, uh, what, is your nickname Dirty? Um, serious question. Because you have joked about it on the few podcasts, have you guys ever considered hiring a marketing person to help sell your merchandise? You deserve to be repped big time. Hmm. Well, uh, thank you, Dirty. Um, <laughs> no, no. I here's a, we enjoy having a good time and being off the wall. And and again, we we've got our stuff at T public. I'm going to put the link up on the screen for those that are watching YouTube. You know, here's the thing, uh, uh, you know, real talk here. We have a good time. Absolutely. We want to rep the brand. We, we love repping the brand with the, you know, the mugs and the t-shirts and the phone cases and, you know, mouse pads and stick, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's just a fun complimentary piece. If people buy it, that's great. If they don't, that's fine too. We we made it to complement the the podcast. Um, so in that respect, I'm I'm just I'm happy with just the three man crew that we've got here. Uh, everything is controlled. Everything is, you know, we've got a pretty good synergy. Believe it or not, when we're you know in our DMs and trying to figure things out. So I appreciate it, Dirty. But uh, yeah, I, I think we're I think we're good with where we're at. I agree, and I tell you what, as far as needing to hire a marketing guy, no. You know, you thought Ed McMahon was good with the publisher's clearinghouse. Ain't nobody got nothing on tubs when he delivers that that initial right out of the gate promo. I mean, nobody, nobody does right. it like Chris Tubbs. Wow. Three, two, no. one. <laughs> The only thing I got to add to that, I I agree with both of your assessments. The one thing I'll add is that even though we are a small three-person crew, not beholden to any advertisers or sponsors, doesn't mean that we wouldn't accept advertisers and sponsors. So, hey, anybody wants to get your name plastered uh, across the AWA AWA Unleashed podcast, Mm -hmm. Come on board. Uh, after I said that, it's like, who in the hell would want to have their name associated with this trio? Joe, get on the phone and call your buddies at Sex World and see if maybe they might be interested in, you know. I've already tried, but they've been so busy getting your orders packaged mm-hmm. up. I get it. I get it. You know, you got to lube the palm to, to kind of work the way in. Come on now. You know, kind of I slide. See what you did there. That's uh... yeah. But no, yeah, no. We we enjoy it, and if yeah, if, if you want to be a part of it, you guys know. Again, so many. Here's the thing: so many people take themselves so freaking seriously nowadays, guys. A little bit of a sidebar here, and if we get to the next questions, we do. I just have to say this: I, I get 
we're in a society right now where anything from sports to politics to wrestling, it's all life and death. Like everything, there's just so much animosity and there's so much hatred and there's so much vitriol and the temperature of everything is so hot. What I love about this podcast is we don't take, we take it seriously to a point, but I don't, I want this to be an hour of fun and of goofiness and of just taking your mind off of the real world. So I feel like that's why I think we just kind of take this unconventional approach. And that's why I enjoy doing this with you guys so much. And that's why I enjoy the people that follow this and watch it because I think they understand what we're trying to do with the inform, but also it's just natural. It's organic. It's off the cuff. We're just sitting here riffing. And I think that something like this in today's day and age, it just, it's needed more than ever just to give people that release. And if we can be that, I want to help do what I can to brighten people's days. Fantastic. Just perfectly stated. This, this is not the Cuban Missile Crisis, folks. This is old school wrestling we're talking about here. And we're having a good time. So come along for the ride and enjoy yeah. it. Don't pick it apart. Don't count how many minutes we spent on a promo. Don't question the date and say it was May 14th, not 13th, for fuck's sake. Just have a good time. There you go. AWA, AWA Unleashed, the all fun zone. Yes. Mostly. Yeah, well, we're all in the we're all in the front of the deal with you guys, but you know, hey, I, I I can put up with that because it's AWA. Yeah, and uh yeah, that's that's what we enjoy. We're all in the friend zone here. Yep. Uh for Mick from Kirk Levy, uh, here's one for you that us old timers remember. Whatever happened to Rooster Griffin? <laughs> I don't even have to say the second part of that. And I heard the giggle. I'm looking at the sheet. Was he the sunburn guy that Larry the Axe brutalized? No. Uh, Rooster uh, was not. Uh, Rooster, <laughs> the sunburn guy that Larry had it brutalized was a guy, uh, Hank Meadows. Uh, the thing about Rooster Griffin and Hank Meadows, you could, you could confuse the two because they were both about 106 pounds dripping wet uh, with, with, uh, bleach blonde, platinum blonde hair. Um, you know, they were so thin, you know, they stood sideways and stuck their thumb, their uh, their tongue out, and they looked like a zipper. Um, Rooster Griffin, actually, I think he went, like, to the Hammond, Indiana area and really did okay for himself. But Rooster was one of those guys, 1970s AWA enhancement guy, uh, at the time, he created a little bit of a stir. He wasn't on the level with a Kenny J or a George Kadaski, but, you know, your Rooster Griffins, your Nacho Barreras, your Caesar Pabons got to be kind of household names if you were an AWA TV fan. Have no idea where Rooster is today. I'm guessing Hank Meadows, on the other hand, is still uh, putting uh, A&D ointment on his, uh, on his sunburn. When you said the name Hank Meadows, I automatically went back to the chef on WTCN uh, back in the day. That Hank Meadows, I'm like, I don't remember the cook coming into the AWA to get brutalized. But uh, no, uh, curious on that. I wonder if Vern up. named him Hank Meadows because of the chef on WTCN. I, I couldn't tell you. And I think at this point in time, it really, it really doesn't matter. Uh, the poor guy is still covered in Larry Hennig's handprints. Uh, you know, all these 50 some years later, imagine that poor guy comes across, across the street from Lake Calhoun, red as a lobster and a guy he's got to face is Larry frickin Hennig. Oh, oh boy. Is there a video of that that exists? Do you know? No, no. Uh, Hank, and I've said this before, this was legit. It was two out of three falls. Hank could not appear for the second fall uh, because Larry Hennig had put welts on him. He looked like a freshly painted picket fence. Uh, <laughs> poor guy. And uh, I'm not sure that Hank ever ever came back to the area. I, I don't. I think he figured his 50 bucks and and trans just was not worth the beating. I can only picture before the match, 
in the locker room, Larry looking over and seeing this crisped version of Hank Meadows. Mm -hmm. And then Larry thinking to himself, oh, I'm going to slap the hell out of him just as a rib, but also just to have a little fun. It's like you come in sunburned to wrestle a match. What do you expect? Rib is right. I think Hank's ribs actually were, were protruding after the match, too. Larry hit him, <laughs> hit him that hard. <laughs> okay. Anyway, God bless Rooster Griffin and Hank Meadows. Uh, got a, a few more left here. Uh, this is for you guys from Don uh, Permachuk. Does anyone know why Kamala had such a short run in the AWA? Uh, Kamala was not going to stay here for any like the time. You know, he, he came in, um, you know, as part of that era when, uh, when Vern was doing the Pro Wrestling USA stuff, and then he wrestled Sergeant Slaughter at uh, Wrestle Rock, and there is Kamala. Imagine that. That is our good buddy, Sugar Bear James Harris, uh, long before he posed in front of those uh, plastic potted plants uh, like he was in the uh, deepest, darkest Africa uh, under the uh, the Kamala name. Uh, did, Kamala did he, was, just a quick yeah. question on that. Did that, I know that was like a, a, a Jerry Lawler creation, yeah. I think, right? That is exactly right. Was that at Lawler's place in Memphis where they did those Kamala vignettes? I think. I think I've heard that. I okay. also heard a story that it might have been in Atlanta someplace, but I, I believe it was, you know, Jerry. And if you take a look at a long shot, I think there's one uh, out there someplace where he's supposedly coming out of the uh, out of the woods, and you see mm -hmm. the pots and you see the plants, and you know they're probably plastic or whatever. Uh, <laughs> just you know the, the the savage area of Jerry Lawler's backyard in Memphis. Uh, I can't say enough good things about Kamala James Harris. Uh, he got screwed over big time in his WWE run, WWF, uh, from my financial standpoint. But, uh, yeah, just in and out in the AWA area. Of course, had a chance to work with him in Sydney, Australia. Wonderful, wonderful dude. Uh, let's see. Kamala, the Ugandan headhunter, the, the Ugandan savage. He, that's a part that always confused me. I understand why... Um, it went from King Kong Brody to Bruiser Brody, I mean, different territories, but I never understood the Kamala part because there was only one Kamala. So why was he the Ugandan savage, the Ugandan headhunter and whatever other iteration? That part, I don't know, but in shameless plug time, but I'm excited because in our Power Town Ultra Series 2 release, Kamala is going to be a part of it. And I've seen the prototypes. They look fantastic. Hmm. I'm going to get me one, if nothing else, than to compare the moon that I have painted on my stomach to see how <laughs> it compares with uh, Kamala's. You know, mine is a full moon. I think his was a half moon. So I don't want to see any part of your moon, man. No, you don't. Okay, l l let me ask you. I just got one question about Kamala here. Doesn't he look a lot like LeVar Burton? He yes. sure as hell does. I feel yeah. like I want to go into reading Rainbow from this. Isn't that something? And you know, and and then you you fast forward to the guy with the face paint and the shaved mm -hmm. head, and man, what a transition! But he certainly does look like LeVar Burton. Absolutely, reading, good call, boss. Reading Rainbow. <laughs> Choreography not necessary, but you you did a good good call there. I, I, I yeah, I used to have talent, but not anymore. Man, I'm I was looking. I'm like, oh my god, that's Lavar Burton. Oh no, that's name's Harris. Lavar hey, Sugar uh, Bear Burton. Lavar Sugar Bear Burton. Sugar yes, Bear I love it. Yeah, I love it. Uh, a couple more here. Uh, this one for you, Mick, from George Nesbitt. Do you consider Larry Zabisco one of AWA's greatest champions of all time? No. Um, Larry, right place, right time uh, for the AWA, and arguably he carried the AWA at a time when they needed somebody to pick up the slack. Uh, from a talent standpoint, Larry Zabisco, and look at, look at Bischoff there. 
holy moly, right out of uh, kindergarten. Uh, Larry Zabisco, talent-wise, one of the greatest talkers in the history of the business. We've talked about his stalling tactics over and over again. At the time, he was what the AWA needed to still have an imprint on the national market. But in the history of the AWA, when you talk Bockwinkles, Ganyas, Crushers, Mad Dogs, uh, I don't think Larry is right up there as an all-time great champion in the AWA. Great talent, yes. Um, So-so was a champ. I I agree. Uh, Fantastic talker and personally loved working with Z. He just... Uh, the, the, the asshole that you saw on camera was not the real life Larry Zabisco behind the scenes. He was respectful, um, nice, uh, for interview day would always order just a plain cheese pizza. Uh, always gave him shit about that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you could, I'd put Z in my top 10. AWA yep. world champions, but the thing is, um, there might only be about 12 or 15 overall champions. Now, the championship changed many times, but there were a lot of repeats, and you've got, you know, Nick's long run, Vern's long run, uh, sort of narrows the, the playing field down as to the actual number of AWA champions. But in the ring, um, and he did this well, and it was intentional. Uh, the over under, okay, how fucking long before he actually ties up? Because he took forever, mm-hmm. and he did that to piss off the crowd, and it worked very well. Last one here, guys, and, and I can't think of any other way to end this one than on this question based on how we started. Uh oh. Uh, this is for you, Joe, from the lunch crew at Medtronic. Time <laughs> to deliver the good or the bad. Shout out to Medtronic. We've heard not not the real shout out, but I mean, give me your shout. <laughs> We've heard so many horror stories about that television taping in Whitewater, Wisconsin. Are we really going to see some of that footage eventually? And how should we prepare? I want to see it. I want to do a show on it. That is not a gimmick. That is a shoot. Joe Chupik, I'm going to let you take it away, and uh, please tell me something good. Well, I got to start off by saying, uh, you know, shout out to the lunch crew at Medtronic. I uh, didn't know that our audience went that far, uh, that that high up on the scale. To insert your own what I mean by, by that for there. But um, <sighs> Whitewater, well, first of all, if we had the footage, when – when I was doing the AWA pay-per-views, I came across the tapes, intentionally did not use it. In fact, I, I felt like every time I walked past those tapes in the library, um, I, I, I saw dead people. I mean, it, it just, it, it, it gave me chills. And, and for the only time in my life, <laughs> I it believed because of the lighting? in ghosts, you know? What's that, Chris? Because of the lighting? Just the, yeah, the entire event. You know, it, it was just the the most disastrous live production I've ever worked on in <laughs> nearly 40 years of being in this industry. Uh, and that includes one camera shoots with, uh, uh, you know, trying to record somebody about their life story at home. It, Whitewater was a disaster. I will say this. If, if we can find the footage somewhere online, uh, and, and I'm going to put this out to all of our listeners out there, if you want to scour YouTube or any other video uh, video platform that's out there and you can find footage from Whitewater, admittedly, I haven't done an extensive search because it's like, you know, wh- why would you go to try to find an ex-wife who screwed you over type of thing? Uh, white water, white water, just, uh, yeah, I, I, I talk about it, bring it up. Um, it happened sadly, unfortunately, if we had the footage, yeah. Um, I, I guess I would subject myself to arguably the worst day of video production that I've 
ever experienced. What's really sad about that, Chris, is that you had an AWA tag team title change on that card. And, uh, you know, the uh, Midnight Express uh, defeated <laughs> defeated Jerry Lawler. That, and that day. Right there. Now, this is... That's this Joe is Cupid. I, Joe, I got that from Joe, right? Isn't that Joe or is that somebody else? Uh, I, I don't know. Is that is that a nose or is that his? You know, it, it's um, here's what I would say. If you are ever going to air that footage, this would be the thing that people should prepare. I believe the question was, how do I prepare for this? You get a hazmat suit and you, you know, have the exit signs clearly uh, lit up on the floor so people can get out of your living room uh, on the way out. Uh, this was absolutely a disaster. Um, <laughs> I've said many times, had Vern just popped maybe for a 40 watt light bulb instead of refrigerator light bulb uh, for the lighting in the arena, perhaps maybe one match would have been salvageable. But this was like stomach flu in a restaurant. This provided better lighting than we had <laughs> it, at Whitewater. Oh, yeah. oh God, I so want to see that. I I really do, and that's not like I really. I really want to do a show. Well, I, I mean, I, I sort of joke by holding this up. It's yeah. not that it was uh, so dark, but it wasn't anywhere near any broadcast standard. And on top of it, in the truck, whoever was doing the um, working the CCUs, the camera control units, Turn down the fucking iris. It's supposed to be under 100, not under 1,000. So you've got blown out parts. I mean, like literally, Kamala would have looked white, with, you know, on, on some of those shots. It, it was. Is that Kamala or Buddy Rose? Can't tell. Uh, LeVar Burton. But but it it, it was it was horrendous from from the lighting to the crew. And I, I, I just want to add, this is not a shot at Whitewater whatsoever. So if you're listening from Whitewater, this, it just so happened that you are the host to the worst live video production that I've ever been a part of. Nothing to do with the town. Nothing to do. This, no. this, was, all, this was all about what Vern and the AWA brought and how they presented it and how they produced it. Correct. There's nothing, nothing to do with Whitewater. White no. Whitewater is a good town. It's just that this is going to go down in lure like some sort of like urban legend about just the the atrocity that was this recording. If I'm a wrestling promoter, the one thing that I want to be sure to do is book a wrestling show an ESPN taping with no lighting in a college town on Halloween weekend where all the kids are out partying and you got a guy dressed up as a nun sitting in the front row. I think you've got all the makings for a blockbuster uh, in the history of wrestling. Yeah, and I'm, I'm serious about the viewers. If you can find it, please send us a link or links. Yes. I can, I can tell you this, that the fact that that even made the air at all is surprising as hell to me. I know for a fact that I never repurposed that footage. So I'm guessing that the only way that footage would exist on uh, YouTube, one of two ways, somebody recorded it back in the day on VHS or two that the WWE would release it because they own the AWA library. There, if they do it, it would be the biggest video production rib in wrestling history if the WWE just put this on YouTube. And if that did happen, then we know that somebody is watching us. Hmm. Very interesting. So we'll uh, we'll have to do... So yeah, if you guys have it, if you guys can find it, let let Joe know, especially because Joe's the, Joe's the production guy. Uh Anything else before we give our shout outs and we take it home? Let's do the shout outs, take it home, and then get ready to a picnic on the 4th of July. Uh, first of all, to everybody, have a safe holiday. You know, yep. have fun with the family, cherish the family. There is enough shit in this world right now. 
Uh, just treasure the moments and be safe. Uh, my shout out goes to our friend in the land of the rising sun, Mr. Fumi Saito, not Mr. Saito, uh, but uh, Fumi, one of the great wrestling journalists in the world. And that is a shoot. Uh, <clears throat> great friend, longtime friend, big AWA fan, wants to come on the show, uh, Chris Tubbs and talk about AWA wrestler, wrestlers in Japan. So, Oh, I'd love that. I would yep. love that. That would be that would be a blast. Absolutely. Very cool. My shout-out goes to a long-time and absolutely loyal fan of AWA Unleashed, um, uh, a comic who uh, has been dealing with uh, some health issues. But my shout-out goes to Joe Tanner. Oh. So, Joe... Stay healthy. We need all of the fans that we can get so that we can stay above, you know, stay in double digits instead mm -hmm. of single digits. But thank you for being a loyal fan, Joe, and keep watching. And, Great uh, game, by the way. And uh, I thought that's why you were going to give him the shout out was because of uh, of Joe. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Mike Moropoulos out of Chicago. Um, emailed me when he became a, a pinfall member. And not just that, but he was just kind of telling me, you know, he's about, you know, a little, little younger than I am, is kind of in the same boat in terms of wanting to learn about the AWA, you know, based out of Chicago. He didn't, you know, he got kind of, he didn't really get the Minneapolis feel for it. So, uh, Mike, man, you and I, dude, we are in the same boat trying to swim upstream. So, uh, Mike, this is for you, and, and hopefully you're enjoying being a member. And if you want to be a member, uh, you can, you know, sign up for five bucks a month. It's our pinfall membership. It's well worth it. That should about do it. Uh, and and Chris, again, you might want to remind everybody about our schedule. Going to be a little bit uh, off the rails next couple of weeks. <laughs> We're like our weekly show. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, next week, no show uh, because the family and I are going to be on vacation. Um, and then uh, the week after, we're going to be back at it. I don't have any idea. We'll probably talk a lot about the, the Hall of Fame coming up yeah. because, Mick, you and I are going to be there. Uh, but we'll, we'll figure something out. Hey, Our, uh, are the two of you going to do a live podcast from uh, Iowa? I, I don't. I think we're going to do something. I know we've got a few ideas in the works. We just got to hammer those home. Um, I think we're going to be we're going to do some podcast. We're going to do a podcast. But I think we've got a couple other things in the works as well, right, Mac? I think that's kind of where we're at. We're still, it, it's still, it's still fluid. It's still, you know, card still to be determined. We are going to be busy though. Uh, yes, Troy we will. Peterson and Chad Olson are putting us to work. So before uh, you imbibe in a couple of those uh, gummy bears, and before we go over to uh, whatever it is Joey's uh, Doey Joey's Doey Joey's Pizza. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to earn our keep. Hey, when you're down there, if, uh, I, I, I mean, everybody's got a camera. Most everybody has a camera on them nowadays. Mm -hmm. Uh, you record some Q and A's maybe with some of the legends there. I happen to know a guy he's Polish, but he's pretty good at cutting stuff together and putting it together. We might be able to insert some of that into a future podcast or even for our pinfall memberships. Just Perfect. a thought, throwing it out there. And the and by the way, that lighting would yeah. be better than Whitewater. Inserting. 